and we'll also send out a recording, but it's great to be live with lots of people. That way we can ask more questions. Yeah. I'm sure many of us have lots of questions. <clears throat> Such a big topic. Um, I did not. To get this out of the keyboard, I'm not doing very well on this one. <laughs> there. Okay. So we have people from lots of places. Um, sure do. New Zealand. Oh, I love that. Nebraska, Chicago, New York, Colorado, um, living in Mexico, New Mexico, Somerville, Utah. Um, I am here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And are you in California, Paul? No, I'm in Baja Sur, Pescadero. Ah, nice. It's in the chat. It's in the chat. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> England. Canada. Welcome, welcome. And Katie's here also in the chat. Welcome. Thank you, Katie. Um, it's working with me and we have just be put some links in the chat that you can learn about more about Paul's work. I'll just do a short introduction. Um, and and then let's begin. So Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, Paul, for being here. I am Nadia Colburn. I'm here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm the founder of the Align Your Story Writing School, where I offer online writing classes. I'm a poet, a memoir writer. I um, have a new book of poetry out. You can find lots more about me at my website. Um, but this is today is really about Paul Hawken. I'm so honored to be here with you. Um, you're the author of, I, I don't have it written in front of me, but like, 10, 15 books, many. No, no. <laughs> it's, 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 I think it's nine or 10. I can't keep going. Okay. It's between nine and 10. Yeah. <laughs> Almost yeah. up there to the double digits. Um, and uh, lots of books about sustainability and how to have uh, businesses. And then really, I think I first, I, I came across your work years ago, but then with Project Drawdown and Drawdown, um, this book, was just so incredibly inspiring with it's called the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming um and you've edited this and i just can't recommend actually this i actually wrote it i i said editor because so many people have done research for the 60 different researchers and i didn't want them to feel excluded actually as the author <laughs> well, I, so, thank you for this yeah, and yeah it's yeah. amazing and it, it's it's incredible information you'll tell us more about it but it also just has a lots of data and and then and then um i think almost even more exciting is regeneration ending the climate crisis in one generation and i keep both of these books on my coffee table but especially when i want something a little bit positive i pick up regeneration because it is so beautiful and it's all about like here, this is wetlands, wilding pollinators, grasslands. Sorry, everyone, could you just mute yourselves when you come in? I thought I had it, so it was set up that way. Um, so it's all of the different ways in which um, we can have regenerative practices to reverse the climate crisis and um, ecological and also social collapse so and you're working on a new book carbon mm -hmm. about carbon um it's called the book of life carbon book of life the book of life probably is the more important life. yeah and um and we're going to be talking lots about you know our ideas the stories we tell our sense of empowerment so i want to hear all about these projects so maybe you could just tell us to start um a little bit about drawdown and regeneration for those people who don't know about the projects, um, and then you can tell us about your new project later. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you. I'm really honored to be interviewed by a poet and a writer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think I have been before. <laughs> I have as many questions for you as you may have mm -hmm. for me, because uh, writing, 
is a world unto itself. I mean, as, as you well, well know, you wouldn't teach it. And uh, were it not. Um, thank you for the question. Well, I mean, it, it really goes back to childhood drawdown. I mean, in that sense that I, I grew up in California and San Joaquin Valley uh, and living on my grandfather's farm. And I just saw the uh, landscape and the farmscape of California being destroyed very, very rapidly by uh, freeways, uh, by housing tracks, uh, by really dumb agriculture. Um, and so very early on, I had this thing about painful. I mean, I, I felt the, the anguish about it because I was seeing it in real time. Uh, and I had this thing, I said then that, uh, you know, she, you know, nature should be in charge, not, not, not human beings, and certainly not men with all due respect. And, <clears throat> and that she was the only one that had a valid, a valid planetary driver's license. <laughs> it's like, it, it just, seemed obvious to me it wasn't even about being gender hip or gender this is like she's a one with no one in the history of civilization that we know of has called the earth father earth no one it's called oh, mother earth. Right? yeah so them. and they didn't talk to each other and, and get yep, every single culture called it the mother and it is that. And so you can look at the, the meta crisis that we're in and so forth is like, how are we treating mom? Badly, okay. But we'll go back to Drawdown. Drawdown started in uh, 2001 in my mind. And at that time, uh, there was the third assessment of the IPCC had come out and it was more dire than the second, just like the fourth and fifth are more dire. You know, each one is, and <clears throat> they successively become less, um, tempered by Venezuela, Russia, Saudi Arabia, United States, and other oil producing nations. At the beginning, they were really tamping it down. And that doesn't really hold so much. But it's considered consensual science. And with all due respect to science and consensus, there's no such thing. Science is evidentiary. It's not about consensus. So uh, one scientist, as often is the case, can be absolutely correct and all the rest of the science can be incorrect uh and they're all consensual over there you know and that's what science is it's always <clears throat> discovering and finding out new things and discarding the past and looking at it so science is always a moving target in terms of what it knows but what i did know then i did see is that there was no uh place you could go to at that time in the world that actually gave you uh instructions uh, about what to do there was no what to do book and i asked people for several years ngos and uh institutions universities people i knew said could we do a book and it had two things one is the 100 most substantive solutions and then the other thing was about reversing global warming, because at that time, and even today, people use the term net zero and carbon neutrality, which have no meaning to me. Um, it, it, this is in language, it's silly language, carbon neutrality, that's the last thing we want a carbon molecule to be as neutral. And, um, <clears throat> and I said, the goal, name the goal, the goal is to reverse global warming. And that's drawdown, that's in the literature, but it wasn't used and, and you didn't see that term. So uh, um, so that was it. And then for seven, eight years, I mean, I mean, oh gosh, I don't know how long, until 2013 anyway, uh, everybody said, good idea, we don't do that, or why don't you do it, and all that sort of stuff. And then in 2013, Bill McKibben wrote that article called Global Warming's Terrifying New Math. And that article was based on Mark Campanali's work at Carbon Tracker in London. And what he did is he looked at the balance sheet of every oil, gas, and coal company that he could get his hands on. Uh, some of them are private, like Aramco, uh, but, uh, and, and calculated how much coal, gas, and oil was in the ground recorded on balance sheets as an asset. In other words, it was worth money. And what he was saying is unburnable carbon. It's not an asset. You can't burn that because that's just, that's the end of the world. And what Bill McKibben did in that article is set a match to unburnable carbon. It was terrifying new math, you know. And uh, so people came to me 
Nadia, who are friends and activists uh, who I love and respect then and now, and said, it's game over. And I thought, wow. And I've never been part of um, uh, AA or anything like that. Um, but this, this is Nua, by the way. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Oh, Nua. you're beautiful. Yeah, she's so beautiful. Aww. And we, um, she was found on the beach here, three weeks old, skin and bones, nothing to her, barely walking. And so we adopted her. <laughs> but the um is that that the, the point where you give up you know you surrender you say, i don't know i i'm an alcoholic i'm an addict i'm this i'm that whatever that's part of the aa process and for me people coming to me saying game over we blew it i'm gonna move to british columbia with you know uh was a sign actually that it was an opening it's the other way around and these were very literate, very uh, uh, people around climate, and but most people are not. And so uh, that's when I decided to create Drawdown. And I, I didn't know how to do it, but since no one else is going to do it, I have to figure it out. And so, yeah. And Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's become, you know, it's taught at MIT graduate school. It's taught in fourth grade. I mean, it's taught all over the world. It's in 18 languages, I think. Uh, and, uh, and, but before I set pen to paper on Drawdown, I knew I was going to do regeneration. And the reason for this, and I talk to you as a writer and others, uh, write, uh, writers who write books or even poems for that matter, um, is you need to stick to your lane. Now, whatever that lane is, you got to just figure what that lane is. But you can't be writing a book about X and then say, you know, by the way, a digressive thing into your childhood. If it's not in the lane of the book's intention. It's a bad book. Um, in my, and so Drada had to stick to its knitting. I knew, however, that it was uh, going to create what I call the carbon tunnel syndrome. And that is the idea that somehow if we get carbon right, we're good to go. We get a whole pass to the 22nd century and nothing could be further from the truth. And we got to get carbon right. But as if that was complete and that was you know, sufficient unto the day, that's simply not true. And so I knew Regeneration would be the successive book, the successor book, um, because it's really about creating more life. And basically the premise of Regeneration is that uh, our whole uh, economic system is based on taking, is based on extraction. And, and everybody says that it's an extractive economy. It's nothing new about that. Um, but what, it's different now than, say, even 20 or 50 or 100 years ago, is that we can see the end of the road on that, of degeneration. The planet is degenerated and degenerating as our people and place and water and soil and animals and creatures and indigenous cultures, you know, and uh, caused by this extractive economy. But it's, what's different now is we can see it doesn't go very far. That's what the headlines are telling us. That's what the weather reports are telling us. That's what migration is telling us, you know, from the south going north, uh, whether it's in the Americas or whether it's in Africa. Uh, and uh, so what do we do? And to me, it was obvious you do 180, you pivot. And the question is, can we create an economy that serves people, you know, that takes care of food, needs, security, dignity, meaningful work, you know, our children, education, in a way that creates more life instead of less. Because we have an economy that creates less life. And in 1972, the, the UN had the, biodiversity, the, the Convention on Biodiversity uh, signed by 196 nations. And... Uh, and I say in the book, that was easy to sign because it doesn't say anything. It says we're going to value the components of nature to serve humankind. As the components tell a lynx or an eagle you know, or a beaver that it's a component. It just seems so silly, the language. Instead of the mother, you know, my understanding, the system, the overall mantle of life on Earth. And since that was signed in 1972, they are tracking 32,000 different species and they're half gone. They're half gone since 1972. That's the planet we live on. And that rate of uh, loss 
speciation is accelerating. So that's where we are today. So that's why regeneration, yeah. Yeah, I wonder, I often start, I mean, what you said is so much there, thank you, and also so profound on so many different levels. And I often start by inviting people to take a breath, but I think maybe I'll just do that now because I was born in 1972 and um, working on a memoir and actually in the very opening pages of the memoir, I talk about that convention, you know, like the, my lifespan has been, this has mm. all been happening. Everything that I'm writing about in my life, this is what's also been happening in the background or in the foreground. Um, and that's, you know, it's hard to take into our consciousness. Totally difficult. Uh, totally and, difficult. And I also hear you that there's this kind of gloom and doom game over, which is not a helpful narrative either. So no. let's just, let me, let me invite the singing bowl, if that's okay with you and everyone. Mm -hmm. And let's take a breath and connect to our own life force that we have right now within us. So thank you. Yeah, there's really such an important, important topic. And um, there's this technological kind of understanding, right? Like it's all through the technology, but the whole system, the whole way of approaching our existence on this planet is out of balance from this extractive culture to going back to honoring mother earth and life energy. And so how do we shift that? And these books are so, again, what I love so much about them is it's practical. It's like this actually, here's the data behind it. It's not mm. just, this would be nice. And there's also, you know, I think as writers, we want to help shift the mindset because if we yeah. don't shift our mindset, we can't shift the systems. But right. then how do we under, have all the connections between shifting the mindset, shifting the systems, and then practical actions? So, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the, no, that's the, a big question. But, it's a big question, and I think it's a question that stops people short in their tracks. And yeah. so I think <clears throat> there's better questions and better stories. Great. And, Thank you. Yeah. And first of all, the thing that we have to change is ourselves first. Mm -hmm. and, and and who likes who appreciates it when somebody tries to change them you actually cannot change other people you can hurt them harm them you can inspire them make them laugh you can you know make them cry of course but you don't actually change the person they change themselves and so it's 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 true that people looking at this very globally you know we have this we have the conference of the parties every year and these big global solutions, uh, and hopefully governments agree and corporations will agree. Well, they don't agree, but then, you know. And that kind of news, which is true, is uh, debilitating and depressing and sad. And then you feel like, oh man, we're screwed. You know, if, if you just track that over time, you go, this is not getting anywhere fast. And uh, <clears throat> so I think, what I'm trying to do with Carbon, the Book of Life, actually, is to create a sense of awe and wonder and possibility and to look at the living world uh, as a doorway to inspiration, to imagination, to a different sense of what it means to be a human being right now you know, and what is possible in that. And that's what's missing, I think, because all life, Nanja, uh, lives in community. There is no life outside of community, okay? Your cell has 10 trillion, you know, atoms in it, and I don't know how many molecules, and everything in your cell and everybody else's cell is inert. It is not alive. Is chemically going on and there's all sorts of stuff, energy going in, energy going out. It's not alive. But the cell is alive. 
what's that? Mm-hmm. It cannot yet be explained. I mean, people will offer explanations and so forth, but this is the miracle. And this is, I'll talk about a signal, a sign, you know, a gift, which is like community brings the world to life. Right? And we see community just being shattered by stress and by social media and by advertisements and junk food, you know, ultra processed food and ill health. And, you know, all, all, okay, we know all that. But when we talk about what is possible, What's possible is that all change starts from one person and it goes to two, four, eight, six, nine, you know, and, and, and that seems like, well, that doesn't really do much. No, but yes, it does because community comes from that seed. And in, once you realize it, then plant that seed, plant it <laughs> just like you plant a flower or a vegetable or a tree. And that is community. Community is here today from all over the world, really, but all over the United States and Canada. And I dare say that every single person here is part of community in some way that is germane uh, to what we're talking about. You know? And to have faith, as Thoreau said, faith in the seed, faith in the seed. And, uh, and, I feel like I do. I really, really do. Because I see that, that what's going on, what we're all doing, and I don't know what everybody's doing, but I bet it's really remarkable. What we're all doing doesn't rise to the level of other people knowing about it, except our community or this, or maybe a podcast or so forth. Because the whole media landscape of the world is about the amygdala. Nine out of 10 stories by, by plan, by mandate are about lighting up the amygdala fear flight uh, or freeze you know and that's because that gives the most revenue it's the most click throughs it's the most ads it's the most you know and so i don't care if it's the new york times or whether it's some rag or fox news it's the same thing the same modality is being used in our media and so we are the mediums, we're human beings, <laughs> and we obviously have to do a figure ground shift. Just like regeneration is a figure ground shift, a, a degenerative world. And we have to have patience and uh, kindness. Uh, if somebody asked me what's the most important thing about regeneration, you know, the, the number one most important thing about regeneration is kindness. First to self, you know, and then you choose, you know, the circles. Uh, and it, that sounds so wimpy, you know, when people talking about, you know, direct air capture, we're gonna start carving out of the air and turn into liquid and put in geological formations, all this tech stuff, climate tech as if they were gonna save the day. And instead we're not looking at the living mantle of the earth, our being, our being, and our sense of, of separation from other people and from the living world, from nature, is an illusion. We've been taught it, we've learned it, we speak it, we listen to it, we read it. It's still an illusion. Just because we are inundated with it, we're inseparable to this beautiful communion, sacred communion of life. Yeah, I completely agree. And I just wonder, you know, because we're humans and we live in this human world, um, to to get to our communities we need to drive we need to we feed our children we go to the store and there's plastic around every single thing that we <laughs> buy and then it ends up in the ocean which you know kills the ocean habitat leads to more warming so even when we have this kindness this understanding the systems in which we're navigating our lives are often systems that are, it's like the, yeah, the but, roads are paved in concrete. And we know <clears> that concrete is one of like the most, you know, I don't remember what number it is and drawdown. But so how do we, once we have that understanding, once we're part of that understanding, once we, you know, are continuing to cultivate that kindness to ourselves, to others, then 
be part of a shift so that the passageways that we're living our everyday lives around are themselves one of regeneration. Yeah. And the 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 thing I would say is that, and I'm going to give some examples, by the way, this is the most brilliant time in human history. The brilliance and the imagination and the creativity is extraordinary. And I'll give you a couple examples, one about cement, if you want, but uh, of things that are coming and we don't see them coming until they come, you know. Uh, and two quick examples. One is, and you can look this one up on the web, invent wood, just like it sounds in one word, but invent wood, uh, created by a Chinese scientist who was part of the gifted child program in China, where they look for the, you know, the real bright ones, and they move him into another educational regime. He was in university 15, graduated when he was 18, got his PhD at UCLA in nanotechnology 20, went, did his postdoc at Stanford. University of Maryland and now Yale Materials Lab. And he's a physicist. And uh, as he said to me, and he's in the new book, by the way, and um, um, but he says physics can go anywhere. It can go to, you know, leptons and muons and, you know, subatomic particles all the way to the universe, you know, astrophysics <laughs> doesn't care. <laughs> it looks at everything. And he looked at cellulose under a microscope, electron microscope just a single strand of cellulose and noticed it was structured the same as a carbon fiber in nanotechnology. He's a nanotechnologist. And he's going, he was shocked. And then he then decided to see, well, how strong is that fiber? And stronger than carbon fiber. It's in, it's in your paper. It's in your shrubbery. It's in your tree. I'm looking outside. It's everywhere. It's stronger than carbon fiber. So with the ARPA-E, which is from the Department of Energy grants uh, for 10 years, he invented Invent Wood. And what it is basically is taking a softwood, poplar, pine, it can be bamboo, which is not a wood, it's a grass, but, and take that and boil it with sodium hydrochloride and, and, and things, boil them out again, and then compress it uh, five to one under 100 C, uh, you know, uh, 212F, and for, and then what you have is, uh, imagine a piece of a wood this thin. Okay, now it is 50% um, stronger than steel. It is one sixth the weight. It's one half the cost, and it sequesters carbon, and um, it can replace steel, which is uh, almost 9% of emissions. It can replace concrete. By and I can go into how it does that. It replaces aluminum. Three of them are 20% of, of global emissions. That inventor and that company, Inventwood, has been given $20 million by the Department of Energy to build the first prototype factory. Right now, it's being built and be done this year in Maryland. And there's 1,500 inquiries from all over the world about wanting the technology to for structures, for homes, for, you can build uh, chassis of cars with it. You can build high rise with it. Uh, if, you know, the World Trade Center was built of invent wood, it'd still be standing. It, you know, it, it, it doesn't burn. Uh, it eventually will burn, but steel will collapse way before invent wood. I mean, a, a piece this big, you can shoot a 30 out six at it and it won't go through. And when you hold it, you just like, what? It's like wondrous. But it uses far less wood than, say, you know, mass timber or timber buildings. You have far less wood, and it can use marginal wood. It can use cuttings. It can use bamboo. You could five million acres of bamboo would supply the steel for the world on an annual basis. You know, so um, I just wanted to give, provide that as a, 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 because he saw the world differently, not because cellulose didn't exist or, but we think of technology as, you know, sort of, whoa, what's that? And, you know, oftentimes powered by, you know, um, uh, in chips, you know, by, you know, uh, but other technologies that we don't fully understand necessarily. And this is not, this is so, so simple. And he reminds me of Buckminster Fuller in the sense that Buckminster Fuller 
was similar in the sense he was aboard and sent in the Navy looking at, you know, the wake of his boat and because, and he asked himself, why are bubbles round? In other words, everybody knows bubbles around, every kid, everything, bubble makers, all that sort of stuff. He asked the question, you know, is it a dumb question? Not really. He asked the question to try to figure out why bubbles were around. And out of that came geodesic domes and so many things that Buckminster Fuller did. So what I'm suggesting is that the crisis we are in, and uh, crises, you know, uh, are also creating real breakthroughs in people's thinking and ways of understanding each other, the world, and where we live. And one of the things I say in the new book is what I love about the science that is emerging right now, it's revealing what we don't know. So much more important than saying, I know, I know, I know, I know. That came out of the age of enlightenment, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And the English language is very much about nouns, about naming everything and so forth, you know, and this is a that, and this is a this, and this is this, and what we know about this, and I know. That's the age of enlightenment. Nothing wrong with that science is great, uh, but it is, uh, it's, it separates everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and then you have indigenous languages, which have more verbs in relatively smaller vocabularies, more verbs than English because their language is about relationship and relationship is always about recognizing connection and and you know living within that connection honoring the connection you know listening to what that might be and so forth you know so we have two different mindsets and those i think those are sort of merging uh, uh, right now the two ways of understanding with respect you see that in robin wall kimmer's books of course he talks about it beautifully um but I say it's also happening on a practical level all over the world. Maybe people aren't as articulate and uh, moving as Robin's uh, uh, words and, and stories are. Yeah. 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 I just maybe Brady. put in the chat Robin Hammer's work. Um, maybe Katie, you could do that. Braiding, Braiding sweetgrass. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. mm. great. Very helpful. Yeah. And so I just think, I think we're at the threshold. I'll give you one more technology just to, to sort of mm -hmm. maybe give you a sense of. Um, and so infrared, you know, it comes from the sun, infrared waves, uh, radiation, and heats up the atmosphere. And we're blessed by that, of course. But when you get more and more heating, more and more infrared, uh, is caused by infrared coming in just as it always did from the sun, uh, but we radiates out from the earth and then it's getting captured by triatomic particles like H2O, CO2, also methane, which is different, but greenhouse gases capture it. They capture it this way. It's like a bird. Uh, CO2 is up there, and then infrared comes up, and it starts to flap its wings like this and re-radiate some of that infrared energy back to Earth, and that's why we're getting this step-by-step -step increment in warming. This has been known for over a century, so this is not news <laughs> how it works. Um, but um, there's, a, again, same inventor um, looked at that and going, hmm. So he's created a coating. It just looks like paint. It can be white. It can be pink. It can be, you know, whatever color, not black. Um, but it can be a color. And what it does, it changes the wavelength of the infrared. Infrared's coming in is a wavelength. This is our sound, our music, you know, I mean, all... Everything is coming to the sun is the wavelength including, and light, of course, has photons as well. It makes it more interesting. But, but the point being is it changes it to 9 to 13 nanometers. And that wavelength of infrared goes back onto space and does not, is not captured by greenhouse gases. It just goes straight out into space. And so you put that on a building and it cools the inside of the building and it cools the outside of the building as well. And we sometimes forget or ignore the fact that I'm one who does it all the time. I always think of climate up there somewhere. There's climate. There's climate. If you and I are this close, it's between us. This is climate. The same mechanisms we're talking about in terms of CO2, in terms of moisture, H2O, in terms of methane, operate within six feet of each other. You know, so... <laughs> And what, what I feel has happened, Nadia, is that 
with due respect to my gender, uh, male scientists dominate the climate. You know, the the research, the science, IPCC for a long time. And basically what they did is they othered it. Climate is a thing. We want to fight it, tackle it, combat it, right? And it's someplace else. You know, it's a threat. You know, it's like like you want to go time out, time out, time out, time out, time out. Othering the world, people, cultures, genders is what got us into this situation. Because it is absolutely objectifying the world. And then once you objectify it, do whatever you want, right? right. It's, just an ob- it's just an object, right? And so I don't know of a woman, African-American friend who hasn't, don't, knows what other, doesn't know what othering is. Of course they know. But when you look at it more broadly, you see that's exactly the thinking we're using to try to get people to do something. It doesn't work. Right. It doesn't work. So, so maybe if I can try to reflect back some of what you said and see if I'm understanding. I mean, there's so much. Thank you. And I also feel like it's really inspiring to hear about these breakthroughs that are coming they're here and so can be adopted because certainly we've seen just incredible technological changes in the past 50 years of my life so you know we can have others but for as many of us as individuals who are not going to create the new you know infrared technology breakthrough um so i'm wondering so our role perhaps is a to stay awake to possibility right to not be closed off to the possibility of seeing things a different way and seeing what emerges even if we are ourselves are not the innovators but to to have those be ourselves pockets of hope of looking for new things of sharing a sense of what's possible and also um and a, a sense of hope, a sense, and then, and that shift that you're talking about, instead of being extractive or othering, to stay in relationship. Are there other things that, Look, does that, yeah, does that I, the, to you? The breakthroughs I'm talking about is that you have allies that you don't know about. Mm-hmm. And, and things are coming. I can mention them in plastic. I can mention them in a whole bunch of other areas. I'm just saying we have allies. I am not a big fan of climate tech, by the way. Uh, I just feel like you're you're just yeah. still trying to a bunch of guys trying to figure out how to bring carbon back down and yeah, manipulate yeah, yeah. it. It's like uh, I'm not talking about that. And even though these two are so-called technologies, I want to emphasize it's about s- seeing the world in a different way, you know. And that that's the core of that. And so, so I, I, I have sorry, a, to interrupt you. So I'm just trying to. For myself, because this is so much my question, because yeah. I feel like I see the world, but then my next question for myself always is how, once I have this understanding, how does that change my individual actions? Right. So how and do the understanding and the actions that I have agency over in my life go together? Right. And so what I recommend everybody look, go to regeneration.org go to nexus n-e-x-u-s it's the most complete list of solutions more than drawdown but it's by agency and and also not just agency so this is what you can do as an individual you think of a forestation i can't do anything i live in brooklyn yes you can and you know what about where my children go to school this is what they can do as a classroom, okay? This is what my county or province can do. This is what a city can do. This is what a town can do. This is, you know, I mean, it goes all the way to corporations and uh, government. So you see how all levels of agency can participate and be active and so forth. The most important thing about Nexus is not to do something out of guilt, is to find something that lights you up. Like, wow, I love insects. I love butterflies. I love pollinators. Okay, go look at the pollinators, and you find a vast array there's, there's organizations, there's articles, there's books. In other words, you want to go jump in. Okay, and then you are now being really effective where you are doing what you love in a way that connects actually to the 
links that are in Nexus and creating new links. And so, um, it's so I hear you. That's exactly. But somebody, if I mean, we've lost uh, the numbers vary, but probably, I don't know, seventy percent of our pollinators. You know, seventy percent. When you get, according to E.O. Wilson, you get to three, four percent, and the Earth goes back a billion years. Everything dies. Okay. So, and we're losing two percent a year. So, all oh, pollinators. I want to, you know, solve the real problem. That is the real problem, which is obscured by the media, obscured by, you know, what I call the carbon tunnel syndrome, right? Uh, and. Uh, so that's what Nexus provides. Is like it's like a menu. Like, oh, what do, you, what do I like to care about? Do you know what lights me up, or my family, or my children? So actually, planting um, like little gardens can be places that pollinators can stay alive on their journey, right? Like just little gardens in the front yard. That's yeah, that's pollinator corridors. Okay, right, and those yeah. can be, and they, they can be put in cities on the verges in, in the highway. They can be put everywhere, and you know, uh, the most of the pollination is done at night by moths. Uh, so, again, and many moths only eat one plant type of plant, like a monarch. It only eats milkweed. Okay, for strategic reasons, but so. We, if you cut a lawn, it's the beginning of milkweed. You cut it there, you've cut basically a pollinator pathway. So just to start to understand those dynamics, you know, and the and the beautiful symbiotic relationship between a butterfly or a moth and a certain type of plant, you know, you get rid of the plants, you think I'm getting rid of these are a pain in the ass. Okay, you also got rid of your pollinators. And so just to understand what they are and which ones and all that sort of stuff, I'm just using one of the solutions in Nexus where you know, you're going to be very effective, very effective in reversing global warming. Yeah. So I wonder if it makes sense. I know people probably have questions, so mm -hmm. it just as me. But also, I wonder if it makes sense for people actually just to take two minutes now and log on to Nexus and look a little bit and even take a few minutes okay. to think about, at least in my circles, I know many people who want to do more and would like guidelines so maybe to look at it and then to come back and ask you questions and maybe even sure. to set some intentions for themselves like you know this is what interests me now this is where i'm going to start because another thing that can be challenging for people is there's such a wealth of information there where to start so again you're telling people start where you're excited start where there's that life energy and then maybe to, I always tell people in terms of writing, you know, we have so many ideas. Where do you start? Start with something and make a plan for yourself. So as a writing coach, I'm always saying, schedule this on your calendar. You want to do something, then you feel overwhelmed. You're super busy. Make sure you're setting aside even 15 minutes a day. That can be enough to do something. So maybe to take this time to think about what can you do? How can you schedule this into your calendar as something, which is, you know, and I'm sure many of you are already doing many things, but, you know, is there something more you want to do or is there something you want to adjust because we have Paul here? So then I want to maybe take a few minutes here and then open it up to people's questions so that you can maybe provide a little bit of guidance, even if we just have one or two questions um, to support people in, in making those kinds of pathways for themselves in terms of engagement. So how does that sound? Okay. I hope so. Okay. Um, I will then, so Katie, maybe you could just put the link in the chat again and people could, if they're not already there. Um, and I'm going to just ring this. Thank you. We're so it's kind of an invitation to you to go to go explore for a few minutes. Don't lose this window so that you can come back. It's 144 here. So let's come, you know, three minutes, just poke around, formulate your questions. You're going to want to spend a lot more time um, on that website if you haven't been there already, I would imagine. But I just want to give you a little bit of time to, to think and, and explore.
And maybe if it makes sense at this time, um, if people have questions, um, they could just put them in the chat and then we can kind of come to them. So maybe in the interest of time, let's come back together. Um, and Paul, also tell me, do you have a strict 60 minutes? I just want to be no, mindful good. of your time. I'm okay. good. Yeah. Thank you. So I had a question. I saw a question up here that I was interested in um, from Philippa, or Philippa, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Um, this is really great and super important. Do you really think um, these efforts can be truly effective without ceasing to extract and burn fossil fuels? Do we need to do both? Um, of course, of course. Thank you for saying that. So we absolutely need to stop extracting and burning fossil fuels, and we need to do all these other things too. It's not just one or the other, right? Like if we stop using fossil fuels, but we have no pollinators, we're not going to survive, right? So it all is it like well, the <clears throat> that's what I call the carbon tunnel syndrome, which is right. I I, I want to add it, it that's not going to solve it, and and if we don't do it, we're really screwed. So it's very very the only thing to be done, and and that that idea that somehow that that's the problem and we, we're going to work on that and you know and then we're good to go is what i'm trying to say is like thank you everybody who's working on it pretty much not some people are working on it in a way that i just think is really uh impractical um but and not going to make any headway at all but uh but yeah regeneration is meant to be inclusive if you look at everything you'll find fossil fuels there but what you've it has solutions and challenges and that's a challenge. 
uh, what's happening to the boreal forest is a challenge. Uh, in other words, we're killing that thing. It is a solution unto itself if you leave it alone, but we're making toilet paper out of it, you know. And so you'll see there are challenges as well. Plastic is a challenge, it's not a solution, but it's there uh, in Nexus as well. Uh, so it's not like, you know, Holly go lightly and like, uh, this is what we do and go down the pollinator pathway and somehow we're good to go. It's just that everything has to change, of course, and starting with ourselves and our way of seeing the world and being in the world. Um, but we can't be so harsh and hard on ourselves, like somehow because, you know, fossil fuel emissions went up last year, they did, uh, uh, that somehow, you know, I'm hopeless and we're screwed up and I feel like I'm not making enough effort. That does that's erosive. Yeah. 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 So it's, and, and, and yes, you will absolutely see those, um, you know, carbon in the book, in both of the books. Right. Um, and, and, and the websites too. I, I recommend both the websites and the books. The books are so, so beautiful and such a, so nice not but to be beautiful. online also sometimes. Um, but there's so many resources on the website. So it's great to have both. Um, and it's, and it's, and again, it's that both, but I also love what you talk about versus the, um, the problems versus the solutions. And we're very, as you were saying before, a problem oriented society, you know, you're going to get more hits when on the news, when you talk about all the disasters. So we are a society that our psyche is now geared towards disaster. We're a disaster psyche. We're a traumatized psyche. And I think to have that regenerative practices from the inside out to remember there are these amazing, wonder-filled, wonderful solutions that mm. we can, that can light mm. us up that can connect us. I think that's what's so, you know, partly what's so inspiring about your work. Um, it'd be fun. It'd be fun to read the last paragraph of the new book. Oh, please. That would be an honor. It, at, at the end or whatever, you know, I mean, well, do you want to read that now? And I, we have some other questions also about kind of tending to our own inner regenerative spaces so that we can do this outer work. Um, uh, how do you personally do that? How do you take care of, that sense of personal well-being as you're doing this work? Well, yeah, I mean, I take care of myself. I take care of my body and I, I try to take care of this thing we call our mind. Uh, <laughs> and that's a daily task, you know. Um, the mind has, what, 30,000 thoughts a day if you're not careful. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and they're you know they're all going to snag you if you're not careful. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I'm very fortunate. I've been taking care of my body since I was 19, and and I I don't have any conditions. No, no. I I, I finally had a physical after 14 years, uh, <laughs> and it turns out I'm a little low in vitamin D. So you know. But I just feel like that's just the natural state of, you know, the, you know, we, we're innately healthy. And then, you know, 73% of the food in the United States is ultra processed food, you know, and we have the highest rate of diabetes, you know, in the world, except for Mexico, which is higher. And we have the worst health outcome of any industrial nation. We spend the most of any industrial nation. We spend $4.5 trillion a year on a sick care system. And as I say in the book, you know, we have a healthcare, we have a healthcare system, so-called healthcare system that pays no attention to food. And we have a food system that pays no attention to health. I mean, mm -hmm. so, this is what you get, you know, when you disconnect two obvious things, which is what your nourishment, okay, food, uh, and health, you know, and so, so again, you know, talking about possibility and challenges and what's, you know, to me, that is a, connecting the food system to the healthcare system or the real healthcare system. It's a huge activity in terms of reversing global warming, huge. Yeah, and soil, right? I mean, the, the skin of Mother Earth, that as that soil is degraded, our food is degraded, our health is degraded, our 
climate is degraded it's all connected um like literally I mean, roots, right yeah. so, soil health plant health human health are inseparable and yeah. yet we have a food system and an agriculture system and syngenta corteva and Bayer, monsanto cargill that have separated that as if more food is better instead of better food is better <laughs> and you can't make better food unless the life is in the soil from whence the plant derives its nutrients and it's so so yeah and again and just for those right. people thinking about like oh but we need to feed the poor there's plenty of ways to feed feed all the people of the world if we eat differently and have regenerative practices right um we know that so the best way to feed feed, feed the, the, the yeah, but the best thing to think about we, that's a very dangerous thing. We need to, because mm -hmm. we have really fucked over this world. Excuse my French, you know, because when I, when I send a regeneration to Kyle White, who's the citizen Potawatomi, like Robin Wall Kimmerer, and I asked him to decolonize the language, because what happens is me, I'm talking about white males. We say things that are actually offensive to indigenous people. They won't say anything. They won't. They won't object. You wouldn't even know it, but it still is. They're used to it. They're used to us saying things in certain ways. When I got back to manuscript regeneration, the first thing that was circled in the second paragraph was the pronoun we. Mm. And who's we? You don't speak for me. And I took it out throughout the whole book. So, so just that, you know, again, we're so used to, we are so used to, okay, I just did it, right? Just to, to demonstrate it, uh, have become a, accustomed to using the first person uh, plural. And it's like, well, that's a crux and it's not true. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what is preventing the world from being nourished? That's a more interesting question. Mm -hmm then we need to feed the world. Love that. Love yeah. that. And that is such a beautiful um, language, right? Like the relationship between language and our actions, our mindset, our language, what we communicate, how we communicate, and then how we think about solving the problems. Where Absolutely. we think about our, how we stay in our own lane, as you were talking about before. As and a writer, and as in a single book, yeah. 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 Um, are there questions here that people have? Um, Just someone said, always considered we made the action more inclusive. No, it does not. It, mm -hmm. it excludes. That, yeah, that's really, the point. That, yeah. That's, the, that's what Kyle was saying to me. No, we feel excluded when you say that. We don't feel included. You don't have the right to speak for our citizen Potawatomi culture or, you know, Onondaga or the Maidu or et cetera. You know, that's what you settlers and colonists have been doing ever since you got here, you know, and look at the result. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But yeah. It's, the intention is inclusion, which I get. And that's really important. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, do people have, Dara, how can we make significant change when our politicians in the corporate world have the power and money to keep us on a downhill slide? So how <laughs> do we deal with the kind of, yeah, corporations, government, well, and, one thing and what that... ways we take action, not we, what ways can I? That's a question I also have that Jara has, Jara and I both have, yeah. Um, I feel that the Green parties or alternative parties, whatever, have um, made a huge mistake. And that is, they, they went right for the top. Jill Stein prevented Hillary Clinton from being elected. Okay. <laughs> just, <laughs> that, that's just a fact. And why, wh wh to what end? Okay. But what about the Green Party in school boards? What about in city councils? What about in county supervisors? What about mayoral? That's where if it's the Green Party, there's other parties. I'm just saying that's where it should start. And like I said, community, plant it, and grow it. But to try to get to the top, like RFK is doing and so forth, is really uh, 
as the other person said about being inclusive, it's not inclusive. And so you have to earn that in this political system. And where the the concern about the political, you know, system is ubiquitous. So that's there already to be tapped into, but you can't tap into it by taking on the polarization that exists in the political environment. And the second thing is the corruption, the absolute obliterating corruption of corporation and corporate money into political parties, uh, both parties, but more particularly uh, MAGA and Trump parties, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's on both sides and so forth. And, and <clears throat> where's the Seattle movement? Where is, you know, where, I mean, where, where's Topeka? Where, <laughs> where is the grassroots there, you know? And uh, so, that, uh, but it, the, the question is very well taken. I mean, it's very, very difficult to deal with corruption. We are in an age of corruption and, uh, you know, yeah. I personally feel like this coming election in the U.S. is also still very important as imperfect, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um, but Trump is very clearly running on drill, baby drill. So <laughs> that's very serious. and. Um, the the yeah. president has a lot of power and so i do i personally part of my personal climate action plan is to get involved in the election leading up to november um but i wonder if people want to just as for a little bit of accountability put in the chat if you want some action plan for yourself something that you want to do that maybe you wouldn't have done otherwise as someone who's a writer uh -huh. <laughs> i feel like i spend a lot of time um with media, right? Like writing words, but how something then that that translates into connecting with maybe a different group of people, um, maybe having a slightly different kind of action. And and I saw there was a question here about um, it's important to act individually, but then how do we also connect a community? And I think that that polarity is maybe one that you're, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, but that that self versus other maybe isn't so much of a polarity that when we start to act in community that it's all about community right that we we connect with others and it's through that connection that whoever is around us we can make change but maybe you can speak more to that i can't because everybody's different and everybody's experience uh, is different uh -huh. and i just saw the from um kate adams she was a naki elder in um vermont and you know and is inviting people to help uh, relearn or learn indigenous um, uh, ways of, uh, uh, of of honoring the land, actually, nourishing the land and each other. What a beautiful invitation. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I feel like I, I don't really want to give people advice. Actually, I don't think mm -hmm. that uh, the most important person to change is myself. And I, you know, I, I don't think advice necessarily changes people. Um, what I try to do is be give examples of things that you know maybe inspire you know or provoke curiosity or you know interest or something like that and give a sense of the, because I feel like the, with this whole conversation, as soon as we went into politics and Trump and this election, it all goes down. The energy all goes down. It doesn't mean we're going to vote and not be active. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying is, but that's what happens all around. The conversation around climate and what's going on in the world tends to go to the lowest common, the bottom of the sink, like a marble in a sink. And then everybody's talking about this and that and whether are okay, blah, blah, blah. And I just think that's, it's, it's, we want to be aware of that, but we want to have a conversation actually that raises us up and lifts us up. And th that doesn't mean we're unrealistic. We don't, we, we, we know what's going on. We do know what's going on and so forth, but we want to be lifted up and to that sensibility that we all have, every single human has, uh, about being inseparable and and human life is sacred. You know, And we say, oh, I want to go there. We don't want to talk in romantic terms. I'm just, I'm just saying, be very practical, like the lucky woman, Kate Adams. But, <clears throat> but, but I just think how we talk, you know, it reveals uh, so much and we need to speak to each other and to the world in a way that raises up uh, vibration. Well, 
If you don't mind, I just really actually find that when I do co-canvas, which I try to do every four years, mm. that raises me up personally. Yeah. You know, so that Great. different yeah. people are different, but I personally enjoy the conversations I have with voters. Yeah. And so I'm, again, it's not saying I'm not counting that. I'm just saying yeah. when we talk about MAGA and Trump and corruption and so forth, it's like yeah. everybody knows that. When you talk about canvassing and their conversations, then it's like you're talking to people and listening and they're listening to you. And there's like, and there's a friendship and there's, you know, you're, you're both citizens, even if you see it differently. And that's a really good experience. Yeah, I agree. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So again, to find ways that work for you, you know, that excite you and that you feel like you're connected to other people, to other species, to the water, the whatever it is for you. Okay, a question here from uh, Katie Walsh about how do we make sustainability uh, economically win? First of all, I don't use the word sustainability. Uh, just the reason is who wants to sustain this world the way it is? Uh, I'm not interested, I'm sorry. Who wants to sustain LA or, you know, uh, I mean, so that word got, you know, goes back to 1980 with 87 and, you know, Rio and all that sort of stuff. And to me, um, what we want to do is regenerate the world. We want to make it better, improve it, not sustain what is, okay? Uh, second of all, uh, uh, in terms of making it economically profitable or at least viable and so forth, is that uh, <clears throat> we are an economic system that rewards externalities, that people who put off the cost into a different generation or time or place or ocean or, you know, uh, are rewarded because their products are the cheapest, you know, cheaper than somebody who actually uh, is not. So there's B Corps, the companies, there's lots of companies now that actually don't do that. And they are very open and transparent about it. Make sure you're patronizing those companies as opposed to ones who don't give a hang and don't tell you what they're doing in terms of externalities. Uh, <clears throat> and third, the fact is it is innately, inherently more profitable to regenerate and restore life on earth. And, but our, it's like being like, uh, you know, uh, Alice in Wonderland being swept up in this, <laughs> in Kansas, you know, uh, and uh, I also wonder, I say, Alice Miller, no, I meant the Wizard of Oz. And, and, and being swept up in this thing, you know, and like uh, we're all swept up in that economy, no question about it. And, you know, and most people can't afford to do otherwise. And so, again, all these things, uh, there are ways through. And that's what I want to emphasize. And there are people, really, you know, Michael Sherman, in terms of the thing about how do you make local profitable? Uh, beautiful stuff that he does, you know, Michael Schumann, S-C-H-U-M-A-N, his books and his website. And the, we're here. We actually know what to do. And there's we again, you know, and as humanity, uh, because it's innate to being a human being as opposed to a collective of people who know and those people don't know. And uh, we know because we're human. And a lot of it's covered up. A lot of it's messed up. A lot of it is, you know, confused of course you know that's what we have to work with that's why we chose to be born and chose to be here at this time come and go so why now what what i'm also taking a little bit is just your generosity um and the way in which you learn from other people like you i you know you're so clear that you're not giving you know telling people what to do but you're finding inspiration in what other people are doing in solutions right. in what the world like what the planet does what the grasslands do what the mangroves do right like so when i teach writing i talk about the power of observation the power of attention and it seems to me is what you're doing is you're using your attention to see what's possible to see what other people are doing and to, and what other species are doing what the earth is doing and to learning which is right, what those inventors are also doing. How does this work? Asking questions, bringing that creative mindset and that attention to see where is there something that's regenerative, that's positive, that I can learn from. And so when we have a question, the question is the gold, right? That's, then we follow the question and the answers appear. Not the answers, but the next step appears. And yeah. And 
I you say I don't. That. Yeah. I don't. I don't care if people use the word regeneration or not. That's that's up to them. But that's why I said the most important thing to start with is kindness. Kind to self and and to the world to you know whatever. Uh, your people, your family, your neighbors, um, the people you knock on doors and, and open the door, and you know. So, to me, kindness is the core of it, and uh, and it, it, so it 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 doesn't have to use regeneration as the measure metric. Does this regenerate, not regenerating? If it's kind um, to people, place, and creatures, um, it's regenerative. And kindness is relational necessarily, right? Relation always, to yourself, always, to others, always. noticing yeah. difference, right? Again, yeah. being respectful of that difference and learning. And yeah. um, I think that that path, you know, one of my questions was, so how do we as writers, so many of us here are writers, what do we learn? But I think that that's implicit, right? That That follow that spark of kindness, that spark of attention, um, learning from what, those around us of all different species are capable of doing and staying open to possibility. Um, are there yeah. other questions? And I want to make sure that if you have time, I'd love to hear the end of your, your new book. Yes. And if you want to say maybe a few more words about that book, that would also be really exciting. Sure. Oh, there's a lot of questions. I'm looking mm -hmm. at them. They're good ones too. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, I thought, you were a former student of mine. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, uh, Sweden talks about, they had a citizens council on climate change. This is an interesting idea uh, to have a citizens assembly. And if you live in, uh, say Washington state, I'm just choosing a state, it doesn't matter what, say, let's do a citizens assembly. Let's do it. And get foundations to help it for just the you know rent whole, rental and the URL and you know so we when I when I uh, the next book I have I don't know if I'm going to title I'm writing the next book already but but Ben Zander who is a uh, is the conductor of Boston Symphony I'm, I mean he's not but you know, great conductor um, told me once he said leadership is listening to all the voices all the voices and and so it's like um i don't know how else to say it except that, that when you put yourself in that as a as a person who's receptive and the other thing to your point nadja i mean what drives me is curiosity i'm just curious how did i land here what's going on i remember growing up as a child going this doesn't make any sense. This doesn't make any sense. Why doesn't it make sense? Is it me? Oftentimes I thought that I'm the one who just didn't understand it. And as I got older, I thought, no, actually you understood very well. They, <laughs> that person was speaking from a point of view that was exclusive, othering, you know, selfish, greedy, you know, deluded, you know, full of animus. And, but I thought I was supposed to understand that. And, and I realized as I got older, you know, no, that's, I, I can parse it as a language and, you know, understand what they're saying, but not understand it in terms of taking it in. And so for me, writing is about curiosity, totally about curiosity. I'm just curious about how the world works and I'll never stop, I'll die that way. And, uh, and so that to me is about learning. And, you know, and when learning stops, you know, you might as well leave because, <laughs> Being a human being is about discovering, you know, where you are. There's a Buddhist aphorism or saying that, you know, that you don't have to believe it, you, you know, but I mean, it's so interesting in the saying that to be a human being, to incarnate is just a miracle. It is a miracle. And, and you ask them, well, how much of a miracle? And they'll say, it would be like a sea anemone going out of the ocean, going up a tree, finding a little knot hole there, and uh, having children. <laughs> in, other words, in other words, the odds of you becoming a human are just so 
from their point of view, looking at the universe very differently than you know Christianity and Islam uh, and Judaism is just like it's a miracle. And I think that's really important to carry with us every day, regardless of how you come to that awareness. And if we hear, which we are, then I am just fascinated by what's going on and what we say, what we do, and how the world works. I'm looking outside, and that's what Book of Life is about, Carbon the Book of Life, that's what the new book's about. And I just feel like fascination, awe, and wonder, and respect, or these are the things that will guide us a lot more than threat, doom, fear, and uh, uh, antithesis, or you know, uh, anger. Um, and not to say that those aren't there for a reason, they are, you know, but yeah, I just, I, I, I look at it that way. I, I think I'm a realist. It's not like I'm, you know, Panglossian. I'm not, you know, people know me as a very practical person, very practical. And, uh, and the two examples I gave of Eventwood and Circle are very practical. Yeah. Yeah. Well, also, again, these books are just full of really practical information. So I love that this conversation is it's like really a spiritual conversation we're having in many ways, right? Um, and that's also practical, having a spiritual orientation, in my opinion. In my opinion, speaking for myself, not for we, but um, I also just love all the practical ways in which, you know, and resources and links and organizations and, and kind of scientific facts <laughs> that are basing the information that you're sharing. So I, I love that, you know, we're able to do all of these. It's possible to do all of these things. Now I'm very aware of the we, but it's possible for us to 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 do lots of different things um, on many different li levels at once. So thank you. This is this is so so wonderful. Um, are there any other questions, Paul, that you want to respond to? And then I want to just make sure that we have time for you to read. Read the end of your book um, before before we. I'll read the I'll read the end I'll read the end now before we run out of time and Perfect. just um, if and then if you want to keep going I'm fine. Um, <clears throat> um, it's interesting because um, uh, maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll read just a little bit more than one paragraph. Um, most of us turn down the dial in order to function in the world today. Quote, consciousness, the great poem of matter, seems so unlikely, so impossible, and yet here we are with our loneliness and our giant dreams, writes Diane Ackerman. People sense something momentous is happening. Barry Lopez wrote, we feel ourselves in the verge of something, on the verge of something vague but extraordinary. Something big is in the wind and we feel it. And we know that if we mean to make this a true home, we have a monumental adjustment to make. We must turn to each other and sense this is possible. If you, This is me now. If you are afraid of what might happen in the future, find a person you respect who does not act out of fear. If you feel overwhelmed, read the biographies of Sojourner Truth or Cesar Chavez. If you think being kind, respectful, and polite is ineffective, Listen to Jane Goodall or Robin Wall Kimmerer. If you feel ineffective, mentor a child. Help heal a wounded animal. If you are weary of chasing hope, read original instructions written and edited by Melissa Nelson, a member of the Turtle, Band, uh, Turtle Mountain Band of the Chippewa. To stop the mind from caving in on itself, go outside. Replace digitized awareness with direct experience. Mend and revive a verge, some solid land, a habitat, your backyard, a schoolyard. Reintroduce native plants and provide food and sanctuary for pollinators and birds and learn their names and stories. As Wendell Berry once counseled, be joyous though you know all the facts. Although we face what appears to be insurmountable endgame brought about by ignorance, aggression, and greed, we also live in the most brilliant period in human history. Breakthroughs arise from breakdowns. Renewal results from disturbance. Regenerating the world is the journey into possibility. Vistas open. The extraordinary diversity of voices, social organisms, and entities emerging in the world are rehearsing the future. 
As I wrote this sentence <clears throat> above, a swallowtail butterfly flitted about the window, came in, its wings gently fanning the air above my fingers and keyboard, and then it left. Change and wonder, doubt and fear walk hand in hand. This is the nameless era. It was predicted, but the common fate of prophecy is to be ignored. The juggernaut institutions that lay waste to sea, land, and people cannot endure. A beginning is near, a threshold, and so too is an end. Without fail, meaningful change begins with one person, one idea, one aspiration, an audacious dream. Singularity is the birthright of the planet and every cell. It is the seed of community, planted. Doom and gloom are cobwebs, brush them aside. We seek a rapprochement with our mother, the earth. Beliefs do not change our actions. Actions change our beliefs. Complex realities begin as simple acts, enchantment, humility, respect, imagination, gratitude, curiosity, all openings to the aperture of the living world. Monica Galliano suggests we stop playing God and instead play midwife. We can't save the planet. It will save itself. There is an invitation to create a world that is worth saving. Focus on what is in front of us. We must give ourselves permission to fail, leave room for foibles and giggles, and find a restorative movement we can sing and dance to. Where you are is where you are most effective. The power to act does not lay elsewhere. Fundamental human rights and needs must be met. Everyone on earth comes first. There is no second. Revive, honor, and nourish the wild, bountiful lives that forever astonish us with their splendor and grace. Our intention and reward are the same. To experience and express our irrevocable connection to all beings. It is the only way forward. Yeah. Wow. So beautifully, beautifully said. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think that is so inspiring so and wise and, um, you know, to, to open into these times, to open into mm. them and to, to be inspired by one another. I'm certainly inspired. <laughs> um, I also think that, you know, if people have resources that you'd like to share with the group, send me an email respond to my um respond to my email and then we can share resources with one another um of course paul's work but i'm sure there are many other resources people are doing to have this collective of people step by step going forward with courage with creativity with open hearts with kindness um curiosity all of those things so what a beautiful beautiful inspiring and to this beautiful conversation thank you so much and thank you all so much for being here um yeah yeah and i think that again yeah that that reminder of our own aliveness whatever these times hold and to be big enough to see it not to turn away from what's happening but to embrace it and to take the next the next step, whatever that is, from right where we are at this moment. Thank you yeah. so much, Nadia. It's a pleasure to be with you, to talk with you. I hope we do it again. And yeah, thank, thank you, you. Every, so everyone who attended. I, I wish I could speak to you each individually, but I'll have to do it collectively. Um, but what we're talking about is the is a collective. We're a collective. <laughs> yes, yes. There's so much power here. Mm -hmm. each of us and all of our all of our nexuses all of our networks all of our relations yeah thank you again um yeah i will send out the recording and there are so many resources that paul has um again send me an email you can always just hit reply to any to the emails that i sent out um and be in touch with me. 
I know some people were asking about like meditation in relation to that. I have a lot of um, meditations on my website if you're interested in that kind of thing and resources for writers if you're interested in that, if you're coming here, you know, you're new to my work. Um, definitely look at Paul's work and um, sh share, share the work with your friends. Um, it's so much about sharing, right? Really that spirit of generosity. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, by the way, for posting up all those things <laughs> on the chat so group. Much. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Have a wonderful, wonderful Friday and weekend and um, all the things. Thank you again, Paul. Thank you, Nadia. Okay. Goodbye. Yeah. Bye bye. I look forward to staying connected. Mm.